If 8% of Americans are attending a weekly service, and that is the only time that they are praying and they are reading the Bible, is it any wonder why it seems like the body of Christ is on life support? Is it any wonder why there seems to be so much moral decay and death happening in our nation when we are called to be the righteousness of God in the world? Well, praise the Lord Christ Community Church. Wow, that worship was just so sweet. The presence of God is here. When we said that we were going to meet God here at 8.30 a.m. this morning, the Holy Spirit was at 8.29. Like, all right, where are they at? And so I'm excited to be here this morning. I'm, I'm personally just so excited to be back here. This church is special. Y'all, I've been excited as I've been thinking about the time to come to get here. This church is so special in my heart. So I'm grateful for the entire team who's been hosting this. Pastor Jen, thank you for extending the invitation for me to even come back and be a part of what God is doing here. I hear y'all had a great time last night. Yeah, I heard there was some line dancing. I heard there was some laughing. And I also heard there was an amazing word. So can we give God praise for Pastor Jen and the word that she brought forth last night? I'm just honored to be a part of what God is doing here. Listen, before I get started, before I get started with the word, I wanna just offer a few housekeeping items uh, that are personal to me. First of all, if you would like to connect with me uh, after this conference and you wanna become a part of my digital community, I would love to have you text my name, Nona, to 33777. Listen, every week I send a newsletter to my digital community that is filled with inspiration and encouragement to help you live out the purpose and the calling that God has on your life. So whether it's personal, spiritual, professional, I share whatever God places on my heart. And if I have free resources, I also share it with my digital community first. And so I would love to have you connect with me. Again, just text my name, Nona, to 33777. Also, y'all, this year, this year, I am releasing my next book. And I'm telling you, this is the most important book I have ever written. Have any of you ever experienced the pain of rejection? Feeling like you've been overlooked, uh, abandoned, discarded, not invited, not included. Well, God gave me a powerful revelation about rejection. And I wrote this book because if you're anything like me, rejection and the pain that it causes has made you think something's wrong with you that something is defective within you. But God helped me to realize that rejection is actually a gift. And my book is titled The Gift of Rejection. Now the pain of rejection is not a gift, but what it can teach you about yourself and about other people is a gift. And so I would be so honored if you would consider scanning that QR code and pre-ordering the book. It's going to be available October 1st, and I know that seems like it's forever away, but the thing about it is pre-orders signal to the publisher that this is a message that people want to hear. And so you can either scan the QR code, you can go to nonajones.com backslash the gift of rejection uh, and order the book. I would be so, so grateful for your support, amen? Last and most important, I wanted to just introduce you all to my first ministry, y'all. I wear many, many hats. I am grateful for what God allows me to do professionally, business-wise. But before I am anything, y'all, I am a wife and I'm a mom. And this is my family. Uh, my husband and I will celebrate 20 years of marriage in June. I got married one month out of college, y'all. People thought I was either crazy or pregnant. They were like waiting. They were like, why is she getting married so soon? Um, but I found the love of my life, y'all. And 20 years later, we are still together by the grace of God. Now, the thing you have to understand, he is not just my husband, y'all. He is my pastor. And so what that means is because I'm a preacher and he's a preacher, uh, when we have those seasons of heated fellowship, um, <laughs> We don't, we don't curse each other out. We bless each other out. So like I, I go to scripture. I'll go to, I think it's in 1 Samuel uh, 21. And I'll say, you son of a perverse and rebellious woman. That is Bible. That is Bible. All right. Or I might tell him he's an uncircumcised Philistine. I don't know. It's Bible. 
But that's my family, y'all. I just wanted you to get a chance to meet them as we get ready to dive into the Word. Anybody ready for the Word? I went to sleep last night so excited because I believe that the Word that God gave me uh, over these next two sessions is really a prophetic word. And God has had me in a a prophetic season, and I've been preaching messages with a heart of calling people back to the authentic worship of God. As I was thinking about uh, this conference being the Adoration Conference, you know, God took me to Isaiah 29 and 13, where it says that he said, these people come near me with their mouth and honor me with their lips but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is based on merely human rules that they have been taught. And as I think about the state of the body of Christ, y'all, I I get concerned. I really do. Because in, in John 10, Jesus said that he came, that we would have life more abundantly. But if I'm honest, it seems like the body of Christ is more on life support than experiencing abundant life in Jesus, amen? You know, when I think about the last four years in particular, I wanna give you just a few stats. You know, the last four years since the pandemic, um, it feels like there has been a just spiritual sifting within the body of Christ. Um, Looking back at 2009, 90% of Americans identified as Christian back in 2009, 90%. And 50% of Americans were actually attending church on a weekly basis. But I want you to fast forward to right before the pandemic in 2020, 20% of Americans were attending church on a weekly basis. That's a drop of more than 50% in 11 years. And as churches started to reopen uh, during and after the pandemic, pastors were reporting that they were seeing on average about 40% of their pre-pandemic attendance. And so I want you to do the math. If if 40% of 20% is attending church on a weekly basis, what that means is 8% of Americans are attending church on a weekly basis. And you may think, wow, you know, why does that matter? Well, it matters because Barna Research released a study and they found that the vast majority of professing Christians only pray and read their Bible in a church service. So if 8% of Americans are attending a weekly service, and that is the only time that they are praying and they are reading the Bible, is it any wonder why it seems like the body of Christ is on life support? Is it any wonder Why there seems to be so much moral decay and death happening in our nation when we are called to be the righteousness of God in the world. Well, what God called me to do today is I'm going to use my two sessions to conduct a bit of an annual exam. And uh, if you know anything about a physical annual exam. That's the time when your uh, physician will assess the state of your physical health. Uh, They will look at uh, certain key indicators to determine how healthy you are physically. But you see, there is a spiritual corollary. And what I'm going to do today is we're going to do a spiritual exam. And for those who take notes, I'm going to teach from the subject vital signs vital signs. Because you see, as daughters of the Most High God, we should not only have life in Jesus, but there should be evidence of that life in Jesus. Now, clinically speaking, there are three primary vital signs that will be checked if you happen to go to, for example, an emergency room. Uh, That's going to be your heart rate, your temperature, and your respiration rate. Now, your heart rate matters because it essentially indicates the strength and the rhythm of your heart. And your temperature matters because that indicates how hot or cold you are internally. 
Your respiration rate matters because that indicates how efficiently you are processing carbon dioxide and oxygen. And so the strength of your vital signs determines how alive you are. If you have a strong pulse, you are living. If you have a weak pulse, you are dying. And if you have no pulse, you are dead. So today, we're going to do a bit of an assessment to see where we are with our spiritual vital signs. Because I am believing that after you leave this conference, you're not just going to be alive in Jesus. You are going to have abundant life in Jesus. Amen. Will anybody agree with me on that declaration this morning? I need to give a quick caveat. So you see, um, I'm a preacher. And so what that means is I may talk loud. I may talk fast. I may do some cartwheels. I don't know what's going to happen, but I will tell you this. Feel free to say amen, preach, preacher. That works. Clap your hands, whatever. You're not going to interrupt me. All right. Be free. Be free. So I'm going to be in the book of John chapter five. And I want to start reading at verse one. There's a story here that is really important to signifying what it looks like to receive life in Jesus. The Bible tells us that in verse one, sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. He went for one of the Jewish festivals. And there in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate was a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda. And it was surrounded by five covered colonnades. At that pool, there were a great number of disabled people who used to lie around. They were the blind, the lame, and the paralyzed. Now, one who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and he walked. The day on which this took place was a Sabbath. And so the Jewish leaders said to the man who had been healed, it is the Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. But he replied, the man who made me well said to Pick up your mat and walk. Now, here we have a situation where Jesus illegally heals a man. And this man had been in a condition of disablement for 38 years. But apparently, not only was it illegal for Jesus to heal him, it was illegal for him to even receive his healing. So it was illegal for him to take up his mat and walk. The Jewish leaders were so upset that Jesus healed this man and he received his healing, that they were upset with Jesus. And then Jesus has the audacity in this story to refer to God as his father. That incensed the Jewish leaders. They were like, how dare you be so familiar with God that you would call him your father? Well, when Jesus hears them saying this, he goes on to say in John 5 and 19, very truly I tell you, the son can do nothing by himself. He can do only what he sees his father doing because whatever the father does, the son also does. For the father loves the son and shows him all he does. Yes, and he will show him even greater works than these so that you will be amazed. For just as the father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the son gives life to whom he is pleased to give it. Moreover, the father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the son, that all may honor the son just as they honor the father. Whoever does not honor the son does not honor the father who sent him. Very truly, I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. Jesus says, that he came to give life. And not only that, he said that all who hear his teachings and believe his father will receive eternal life. Now, that sounds great on the surface, but if you're anything like me, it kind of begs a question. How do I know? 
how do I know that I have life in Jesus? Well, I think that our text actually gives us uh, an answer. Because if you notice, going back to the story of the disabled man, there was evidence that he experienced life after he encountered Jesus. We see a change in him after he encountered Jesus. You see, this man had been physically alive before Jesus, but it was after he obeyed Jesus that he experienced abundant life. It was his condition that had constrained him to a small and limited understanding of what life could be, but after he encountered Jesus, he experienced what life should be. And this is why I want you to understand, sisters, that when you have life in Jesus, there are signs that will follow you to the point of your obedience. When I read this story, I think a lot about my own life. Because you see, I had the great privilege of not growing up in a Christian home. Now you may think, how in the world would that be a privilege? Well, when I was about 12 years old, a classmate of mine invited me to church. And I remember not knowing what church was, but I remember going to the church thing and people were so kind and they were just so welcoming. And, and I don't have time to tell you my full story, but I had a very dysfunctional home situation. And so it was such a contrast to what I was experiencing at home that I immediately felt like something is different here. And then the very first sermon I ever heard, the pastor said that God is a father to the fatherless. And I had lost my father shortly before my second birthday birthday. And so when the pastor said that, I immediately thought, well, if God is a father to the fatherless and I am fatherless, who is God? At the age of 12, I started to go to youth Bible studies and, and I started to read the Bible for myself. And I was so curious about God. I had a level of curiosity about God that my peers did not share because they grew up in church. And so for them, God was just familiar. For them, church was just a thing that you did. But for me, it was so new and it was so powerful. And it caused me to say, what must I do to be saved? So I went to my youth pastor and I said, listen, I don't, I don't know what this requires, but can you help me? I want to be saved. I want to follow Jesus. And he shared the gospel with me. And after he shared the gospel with me, y'all, something in my heart radically changed to the point where I changed. The music I listened to changed. The television shows I watched changed. Even my friend group changed because what I realized is that when I accepted Jesus as Lord of my life and when I started to follow him, I could no longer stay the same. Just like that man at the Bethesda pool, it was my encounter with Jesus that raised me to life. Jesus gave me life, so my life had to change. And this is what I'm coming to tell you today, my sisters, is that if we truly want to adore God, if we truly want to honor God, we have to have signs that we are alive in Jesus. There are signs that follow those who believe. And when we are alive in Jesus, there are three spiritual vital signs that should indicate our life in Jesus. I'm going to cover each of them because if we can check these boxes then we should know that we are absolutely following the one true God. The first spiritual vital sign that should be present in our life is our spiritual pulse rate. Because our spiritual pulse rate indicates the state of our inner man. What do I mean by that? You see, a physical pulse rate provides an indication of the strength of what's happening on the inside of somebody's heart. As a matter of fact, if you have a weak physical pulse or if your rhythm is off, you may have to get a heart transplant physically. 
And if we go to the book of Ezekiel 18 and 31, the Bible says, rid yourselves of all the offenses you have committed and get a new heart. You see, our old heart is filled with rebellion and anger and pride and malice and jealousy and immorality and envy. And so when we are raised to life in Jesus, it requires that we get a new heart. It requires that our inner man starts to change, starts to shift, starts to elevate. And this is why this may not affect some of you, but have you ever noticed that there are some people who say that drama seems to follow them wherever they go? They're like, I just don't know what it is, but it just seems like drama follows me wherever I go. I've got news for you. <laughs> drama doesn't follow you wherever you go. You just take you with you everywhere you go. Yeah. And so once we actually realize that it is the state of our inner man that indicates the strength of our spiritual pulse, we begin to pursue a new heart. And the evidence of a new heart is the fruit of the spirit, which is why we have to ask ourselves, to what degree do I bring peace into the environments that I occupy? To what extent do I bring love into the environments that I occupy? To what extent do I bring joy and patience and long suffering into the environments that I occupy? You see, my sisters, we are not called to be thermometers of our environment. We are called to be the thermostats of our environment. We are called to bring the fruit of the spirit into every environment that we occupy. And when our spiritual pulse is strong, environments don't change us, we change them. So spiritual pulse check. What is the state of your inner man as evidenced by the environment that your presence creates? Think about this. The Bible tells us in Proverbs 13 and 10, only by pride comes contention. Do you bring love with you or pride? Do you bring peace or anxiety? Do you bring patience or frustration? Because if you are finding that, that frustration and anxiety and strife is your common experience, we need to go before the Father and ask for that spiritual heart transplant. God, change my heart. Give me a new inner man. Philippians 4, 6 through 7 tells us, do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Where some of us are failing is instead of bringing our anxieties to God, we are taking them to other people. We pick up the phone and we're calling people to complain or maybe we're going online on social media to make a post about something we're upset about. But God makes a promise here that if we will surrender our anxiety at the foot of the cross in exchange, he will give us the gift of peace that surpasses all understanding. People will look at you in that situation and say, I don't understand how she is sane. I don't understand how she is keeping her mind. But you will be able to say it is because I have the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. But our spiritual pulse has to be right. Our inner man has to be right. The second vital sign that we need to check this morning is our spiritual temperature. Because our spiritual temperature indicates the state of our passion for God. You see, in the physical realm, if your temperature is too high, you have a fever, and that can be deadly. If it's too low, you have hypothermia, and that can be deadly. But when you are talking about your spiritual temperature, there is only one setting that it should be on, and that is on fire. On fire. As a matter of fact, in Revelation 3, verses 15 through 16, God says, uh, I know your works. 
You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. God said, I would that you were either hot or cold. You see, when a person has a, a cold spiritual temperature, they know, everybody around them knows, and God knows that they don't care nothing about God. It's cold. They, they, they're not even thinking about God. They don't want nothing to do with God. Frankly, they don't have time for God. When a person is cold, it's very clear. The problem with being lukewarm is that being lukewarm is deceptive. When you are lukewarm, you can deceive yourself into thinking that you are in a place with God that you are not. Because you know the words to say. You know the gestures to make. And you may even have perfect attendance in church. And so you think, well, because I'm checking the boxes of Christian behavior, that that signifies that I'm on fire for God. But when a person is lukewarm, they can sit in the worship service, fold their arms, cross their legs, and not be moved by what is happening in the worship. When a person is lukewarm for God, they can hear the word go forth and be completely unchanged by it. And this is why God said, I don't want you to be lukewarm. He said, be either hot or cold. And I don't know about any of you, but I'm not trying to be cold. So that means that my default setting has to be hot. When we are on fire for Jesus, can't nobody make us stop talking about him. There is nobody who can make us modulate our faith down out of fear of, of, of making them uncomfortable. When we are hot for Jesus, we love talking about him. We can't wait to get into the corporate worship. When we are on fire for Jesus, nothing excites us more than being able to pray, being able to study, being able to be in community with other believers. When we are hot for Jesus, it is evident to everybody around us that we love him which is why we got to do a spiritual temperature check. What is the state of your passion for Jesus as evidenced by how you express your love for him? You know, one of the most sobering passages of scripture for me is Matthew 7 and 21. Jesus said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven but only the one who does the will of my father who is in heaven, not the one who hears the will of my father, not the one who knows the will of my father, but the one who does the will of my father. He says, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you away from me, you evildoers. There are going to be a lot the lukewarm followers of Jesus standing at the judgment seat of Christ that are going to be shocked when he says, I'm sorry, who are you? That is the most sobering passage of scripture for me. You know what, honestly, what keeps me pursuing righteousness when I have the opportunity to do all types of stuff is the recognition that one day I'm going to have to stand at the judgment seat and I'm going to give an account for everything that I have done. Not just publicly, y'all, privately. I don't take this as a joke. Listen, I know that we see scandals happen all the time. We see people falling all the time, moral failures, all types of things happening. That happens when you take this as a joke. When you think that because you have a gift of communication or a gift of singing or a gift of playing, that that's enough. No, we have to pursue the righteousness and the holiness of God. That's what it means to adore him. What it means to adore God is when our heart is near him. But a holy God will not come near an unholy people. So we have to check our spiritual temperature. What is our passion for God? Not just publicly, but privately. The third vital sign that we have to check is our spiritual respiration rate. Because our spiritual respiration rate indicates the state of our study life. Nona, how is that possible? That doesn't even make sense. Well, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 through 17 says this. 
All scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every work, every good work. You see, our spirit, the oxygen to our spirit is the word of God. Our spirit needs the word of God to breathe. If you've ever been in a situation where you have uh, been deprived of oxygen for some reason, maybe uh, you almost drowned or, or, or maybe somebody tried to strangle you, you had a crazy situation. But if you've ever been deprived of oxygen for some reason, you had some sort of allergic reaction, you will know that one of the first things that happens is you start to get physically weak. Because oxygen is necessary for your brain to function so that your body can function. And what I believe has been happening in the body of Christ, the reason why I think that we are on life support in so many ways is because we have been denying our spirit the oxygen of the word of God. Our spirits are literally suffocating because we are not studying consistently, regularly meditating on the word of God. The Bible tells us in Psalm 1, blessed is the one who does not walk and step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. When we delight ourselves in the word of God, when we are studying it and we are meditating on it day and night, the word of God makes us a promise that not only will we prosper, but pay attention. It says that our leaf shall not wither. Why is that important? Because as we're driving here, first of all, I live in Florida, y'all. So I love looking at the snow while I'm driving through it. Like I'm not, I'm not the type that wants to just like sit in it, but I like to look at it while I'm driving. I look at the trees and the trees are bare. Why? Because they can't survive in the cold. Why? Because the water systems that they need are frozen. But guess what? This says that those who delight themselves in the word of God, will be like a tree planted by a stream of water and that your leaf will not wither. So what that means is in summer, spring, fall, and winter, your leaf will be strong. It will be green. Why? Because you will be sustained. That's the power of the word of God, which is why we have to do a spiritual respiration rate check. What is the state of your study life? as indicated by the degree that you are growing in the righteousness of God. Because the word of God is oxygen to our spirit. And this is why we have to have a strong spirit, y'all. We cannot withstand the temptations that are presented to us if our spirit is weak. You know, I think about the time when Jesus was in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights, and it's, it's interesting. The Bible says that on the 40th day, Satan came to him when he was hungry and he said, if you are the son of God, turn these stones into bread. By that point, Jesus, who is fully God and fully man, was completely weak in his flesh. The only thing that sustained him when his flesh was weak was that his spirit was strong. And he said, let that which is in me be in you also, but we have to feed our spirit. Our spirit can withstand temptation if we feed it the oxygen that it needs. We have to have a consistent prayer life, a consistent study life. We have to delight ourselves in the word of God and create time and space to study and meditate on the word of God. Here's the thing. You don't build a boat in the middle of a flood. You build the boat before you need it. What we do is we end up in situations where we need encouragement and we have no word to encourage us. 
So we end up flipping through the Bible and going to Google and saying, scriptures on encouragement. I know nobody's ever done that. Scriptures on encouragement. <laughs> but we do that when we're not in a storm. So that when the storm comes, we don't have to Google anything because our spirit is Google. Our spiritual pulse rate indicates the state of our inner man. To what degree is the fruit of the spirit evident in our life? Because that is a key indicator of our life in Jesus. He came that we would have life, that we would have it more abundantly. So our spiritual pulse rate should be strong. We should change the environments that we operate in. They shouldn't be changing us. What is the state of our spiritual temperature? When we think about Jesus, do we get excited? When we think about coming into the house of God, are we excited? Or has it become routine? Something that we just do because, you know, we think we're supposed to do it. See, the thing I know about this group here is I'm kind of preaching to the choir because, see, ain't nobody getting out of their bed before the sun rises when it's snowing outside <laughs> to come to church when you ain't on fire for Jesus. But I need you to understand this. There are levels to it. We can always grow in our passion for Jesus. We can always grow in our, our fervency for who he is. We will never arrive until we reach glory. And so what that means is this is our opportunity to check ourselves and say, wait a minute, what's going on with my passion? What's going on with my fervency for God? Is there more that I could be doing? Is there an area of my life where I've become complacent and I've gotten comfortable? Is there something more that I need to, to release so that God knows that I love him above all? And then lastly, what is the state of our spiritual respiration rate? Are we reading the word to check a box? Or are we reading the word because we delight in it? Because we know that it feeds our spirit, that it is the air that our spirit needs to breathe and connect with our heavenly father. Or do we do it just because we think we're supposed to? I believe that we all want to truly adore God. And in order to do that, we have to be willing to examine ourselves, not annually, daily. Lord, where am I at with you as it relates to my inner man? Are there people that I need to seek forgiveness from? Because instead of bringing patience to a situation, I brought frustration to a situation. And I'll be transparent. You know, I travel a lot. I travel a lot for ministry. And uh, there was one time I was, I was in Atlanta. And, uh, you know, I typically will take take either a car service or, or Uber or something like that to get where I'm going. And the Uber driver uh, dropped me off at the wrong hotel. And then when I tried to find the right hotel on my map, I couldn't find it. So I spent about 45 minutes walking around downtown Atlanta in the cold with my luggage because I couldn't figure out where I was supposed to go. But when I finally found the place and I walked inside, there was, a, there was only one person at the counter and there was a man standing there trying to get his car changed on his room or something like that. And so I had walked for 40 minutes around downtown Atlanta in the cold with my luggage. Here I am standing while this man is trying to change the card on his, his, his room. And I'm standing there for about 25 minutes, y'all. And I'm literally like, Jesus, 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 help me, Father. Help me, Father. I get up to the counter. And as the situation would have it, uh, the, 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 the attendant had an attitude. <clears throat> so she was like, yes, but well, can I help you? And I was just like, oh, Lord, God, help me. Jesus. So I didn't say too much to her. I was just like, I just need to check in. Here's my name. Here's my card. And uh, I walked away, and I was getting on the elevator, and the Lord convicted me. He said, Nona, you are so focused on how you were inconvenienced that you missed an opportunity to be a witness for me to her because she was frustrated. There were things that had happened in her life that day that I didn't even know about, but that's why she showed up the way that she did. So in that moment, I had to check my spiritual pulse rate. Like, wait a minute, what's going on with my inner man such that I did not 
become an example of the compassion and the grace of Jesus in this situation because I was so frustrated that I brought frustration to the situation. So I had to go back and ask her, listen, how can I pray for you? How, how can I pray for you? And she began to tell me just some crazy things going on in her life. But I often think that we want God to just download the fruit of the Spirit to us. But you know what the Bible says when you pray for patience? Only by trials cometh patience. <laughs> Do you know how in order to love somebody, you don't love your family. I mean, I, I need you to think about this. You, you do have love for them, but the thing is, when, when it's easy to love somebody, that's not really love. That's, that's affinity. It's when your child is acting a fool <laughs> that you get to experience love. Not when they're bringing home the all A's. It's when they bring home a C, like my youngest son just did, and I'm having to prepare myself for when I go home so that I, I, I bless him. Not what I want to say, but I bless him. We have to be willing to constantly evaluate our vital signs. And if this message was for you, what I want you to do is we're going to have just a, a moment of personal introspection and prayer as we get ready to close in this first session. I'm going to talk about another vital sign in my second session, but in this first session, I want you to have a moment of personal introspection. Like, Lord, examine me. Where am I off with you? If you would, every head bowed, every eye closed. We just want to get before God. Lord, examine me. I offer up to you right now, God, my heart. To show me me, Lord, where I'm off with you, where, where I've missed the mark with you, God. Help me to truly experience the life that Jesus comes to offer us abundantly, Father. I am willing to surrender. I am willing to obey, Father. Show me me. God, if, if I'm off with you from the standpoint of my passion, God, reignite the joy of my salvation. God, if I'm off with you from the state of my study life, Lord, give me the grace to delight in meditating on your word, Father. Help me to know that everything that I need, I have in you because you are all powerful and your authority reigns in my life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen. God bless you, sisters. I pray that you receive something from this message and we're gonna go a little bit deeper in the second session. So God bless you all. I pray that as you go through the rest of this day that God will continue to speak to you as you delight in him because he is going to change your life. That is the declaration. God bless you.